um, we'll get started in a couple of minutes. We have one fewer talk, so this will be a fairly short session, and people are still trickling in and eating their breakfasts. All right, I hope you all had a good night. Matthew is smiling. We are here for the last session of ICCC, and we will. this will be a relatively short session followed by a community meeting with announcements from me, from the program committee chairs, and just general schmoozing. Uh, and, then we'll, and then we'll wander off to Niagara. So leading us uh, in today's fun is Kaz. Take it away, Kaz.
this audible? Good. Thanks for joining us early in the morning, folks. This audible. Is this audible? Closer, but not too close. All right, excellent. Okay, so today we are here gathered around computational creativity and interdisciplinarity kind of comes with the territory. So creativity as a phenomenon of the human mind might kind of seem like it has a natural home in the discipline of psychology. But as a critical aspect of human experience, one that we humans um, feel very intensely about, I think that creativity is considered within a number of disciplines, often social sciences and humanities. Different disciplines have different ways of doing things. You could think of disciplines a little like neighboring countries. We might speak around languages, elect their own officials, and call a single discipline home. Different disciplines, um, of course, researchers can choose to spend time away from home. For our project, we've been interviewing AI scholars who, by necessity, work with knowledge originating in other disciplines. Our interviewees are working to build technologies that are analogs of concepts from human psychology, like creativity, but we've also spoken to people working with other concepts, such as curiosity, forgetting, or even depression. So far, we've interviewed 22 participants, including 11 creativity researchers. This is an ongoing project, so we really encourage anyone who feels they're within our scope to come and chat with us later, and we'd love to interview you. In our short paper, we present some of our initial findings that we think are most relevant to computational creativity. We question first, which human literatures enter AI scholarship? And second, how are ideas from these literatures translated at their port of entry? Human literatures is the phrase we picked up from one of our interviewees. It is just our shorthand for literature coming from disciplines that specifically studies humans, like social sciences, psychology, or neuroscience. When we ask which human literatures enter computational creativity, we're basically asking from those literatures, what do computational creativity researchers find interesting? How do they find what they read? And what might they miss? So we found that when our participants set out in another discipline, they often found it daunting. Like any cultural artifacts, our publications sit in cultural context, in this case, disciplinary cultural contexts. Our participants were generally quite aware of not having that full context and they found it a challenge. They told us of experiences finding that they just didn't speak the language. And so in response to these challenges, interviewees used heuristics that really affected which literature made its way into their technologies and theories. Some participants relied on strategies like citation chaining or teaming up with a native speaker who helped them sort of sort through what to learn about. Others didn't really stray far from home. Instead, they were able to rely on work by seminal scholars who had done critical translation work for their fields. For example, Margaret Bowden's model of creativity was unsurprisingly very often mentioned and her work was recognized as a huge service to the computer and cognitive sciences. However, some participants expressed concern about relying on works like these. A single model can't explain a complex concept like creativity completely. And as time passes, the concept as it's known in AI can become disconnected from ongoing conversations in other disciplines. And so for these reasons, while it can be daunting to sample recent work in an unfamiliar language, we suggest that researchers should at least try not to be afraid to read broadly. Sure, your understanding will not be perfect and some context will be lost. But even a small amount of time challenging yourself with new ideas from another discipline can help to rekindle those connections across disciplinary conversations. And so this is an opportunity for reflection about how your choices um, of sources influenced your work. Now let's turn to what happens to ideas from human literatures when they enter fields like computational creativity. After all, the activities of those of us who are developing artificial intelligence are starkly different from those of scholars in other disciplines, even if we're studying the same concepts. So broadly speaking, in AI, we're often thinking algorithmically and our lines of thinking tend to be oriented toward uh, taking steps that would eventually lead to the software or hardware that we would need to manifest something like creativity. Conversely, in my home discipline of anthropology, many writers are trying to elegantly thread a theoretical needle using almost poetic language. For example, definitions in anthropology can sound like Margaret Mead's description of the artist as someone with a kind of divine discontent with all that has gone before, however good. When I pulled this as an example, Nadia said she had no idea what it meant. And I think that's kind of the, the crux of the point. 
And so our interviewees described the language and other disciplines with words like open-ended, blurry, or ambiguous. Ultimately, the publications they were reading were not written with the goals of AI in mind. Participants mentioned choosing some definitions over others because they were easier to formalize or evaluate, or they had to interpret an artfully ambiguous definition from human literatures making decisions along the way. Interpretation or decisions made while translating an idea from human literature are of course foundational to interdisciplinary work. However, decisions such as these don't always make their way into final publications. Social sciences offer many methodological tools, some of which have already been raised by numerous papers at this conference, for reflecting on and then documenting the unexpected assumptions and decisions that are part of any research process. And so we recommend that as a community, we should encourage publishing our reflections about paths taken and not taken. Sharing our reflections on our personal journeys through unfamiliar disciplinary knowledge might provoke novel thinking and discussion. And so we want to thank you for your time and please come talk to us about your project, our project. And if you're not sure you're within scope, still come talk to us. Okay, thank you, Nadia and Fawn. Uh, do we have questions? It's early in the morning, but let's get involved, folks. All righty. So sometimes the issue with, with doing this, uh, trying to figure out how to use math and logic to model something you've learned um, in a different field is it comes through quite soft and you have to figure out, okay, and this is what you were talking about, inter interpretation. How do you interpret this as, you know, in a, in a direct form of, of sometimes math and logic that you would need for programming? Occasionally we get these amazing people I would play like Ekman for emotions and faces and Laban for dance, who actually seem to have this way of taking this, this ambiguous area and at least parsing it for us. Um, any thoughts on, on, on how you take sometimes more open, ambiguous uh, uh, knowledge and try and kind of parse it at the level that, that these people have done and we're trying to do? I can start and you can add if I miss anything. Um, I think I think everybody had different approaches that we spoke with and it's hard to point to any one single approach and say that's the best way to do this because they're fundamentally very different styles of knowledge. Um, I think the point we're trying to make in the paper is that there are also ways for simply documenting the decision-making process of turning that open-ended definition into something um, that can be formalized. and recording those decisions that are made, however they're made, might be an interesting research finding in and of itself that helps somebody replicate um, or innovate on whatever you do. I guess the only thing that I would add to that is that um, this is an ongoing project, and I think that's one of my goals with this study is to learn more about the other processes that, that people have so that we can share those and we can um, like make use of them, I think, as a community. And I, I think that that is uh, something that I really hope we get going forward. Yeah, I should add uh, the idea for the study in part came because of Nadia's work with computational creativity or curiosity, sorry, um, and uh, and trying to learn more about uh, her own processes. So um, we're, we're not necessarily just talking about everybody else. That's also something that's happening within our own research duo. We have time for one more question. You guys decide, right? Yeah. <laughs> You're closer to me, I win. Um, I wanted to ask about your second point here about the continuing to support the legitimacy of reflective data. Do you have any specific suggestions around how to report the sort of decisions made in interpretation? Yeah, happily. Um, I think there were some good examples in this conference already uh, for people who are bringing um, ideas from qualitative analysis into their work. Um, and so um, there's lots of like there's kind of myriad methods in the social sciences, but some might be autoethnography, um, science, technology, and society uses that in aligned with key studies in a very kind of helpful way, as does UX uh, research. Um, some other ideas, I think somebody at this conference mentioned thick description. Um, a lot of people have been doing kind of thematic analysis, but just the act of maybe keeping a keeping a diary of decision making, um, as, as weird as that might sound, and then thinking of that as a type of data in and of itself is something that other disciplines often do. Thanks. 
All right, let's give another round of applause to Nadia and Juan. So our next speaker uh, is Alight Isak, who will be uh, talking about stories. Stories stay, lessons leave, uh, principles on AI art from photography. Thank you, Alight. Hi. I think, it, I think it's good. So good morning, everyone. So I'm a light. I'm a PhD student in interdisciplinary design and media at the College of Arts and Media and Design at Northeastern University. And today I'll be speaking on principles on AI art photography with the overarching wisdom being that stories stay and lessons leave. So I'll be tracing this with regards to the concept map. Um, of the paper and the methodology they'll be using throughout as research to design where there's theory and then the instantiation of those will be design artifacts. So to start off with technology creates new affordances and in that case being photography as an affordance that came about through the camera. And photography in itself came about to be a discipline through various iterations through the people that were interacting with the medium. So there were cyanotypes, there was the printing out method, and to the extent where pictorialism, which was a movement that really grounded photography to become an artistic discipline in itself. From this, we can grasp different lessons in which we can draw various principles in which I'll go through one by one. So to start off with, some are more trivial than others. It's the sense that technique creates a discipline. It's the technique that you have within your ability to use a medium per se that allows you to uh, have a discipline that can in its sense stand on its own. And for this, the design artifact is what I'll be speaking of next is of an ARR technique in which I look about the presence of electrical activity in fungi. So this is an example that came about when I was reading an academic paper that talked about spiking activity in mycelium networks. It wasn't necessarily, so the researchers talking about how it wasn't something you can see through a microscope, nor was it purely imagined, it was somewhere in between. And so to grasp that in between of a sort of imagined data set is when I prompted this image for activity of uh, the possibility of finding the current within the hyphae. So what you see on the left is more of an outside look, an external one of the spiking activity. And on the, on the right is the actual activity within the current moving through the hyphae. Next, we have the second principle, which is that instrument is to transition from a tool to an instrument. This exists still on the metaphorical sense, where it's the analogy of transitioning AI from, say, the paintbrush to the canvas. So what does it mean for the AI to be the canvas as opposed to the paintbrush? And so for this theory was really looking at more pragmatic points of view with regards to what's artistic and what's aesthetic, the difference between experience as judgment and artistic expression. And the instantiation or the design artifact for this is the interpolation of experiences. So in hindsight, had I known about Kaz's reframer, I might have done so differently. Um, but this is Google's AutoDraw, which allows you, it's an interactive tool that allows you to draw sketches, which are then rendered upon as um, various suggestions. So what I have on the left is a wave that I roughly sketched. And then on the top right is a wave that it assumed I wanted, but then on the bottom right is the sense of a castle. And so really working back and forth with the medium and interacting with it in a sense of an embodied experience was sort of that transition of a tool to an instrument. And this still exists on the metaphor sense. So there's a little more to do here, but this is sort of the example that I had to bring about. And last but not least is the principle of extending sort of the phenomenology of AI. So earlier on in the interpolation of experiences, it's embodiment, which you can think of sort of as a soma aesthetic, soma meaning the body, but then here you're looking at just the aesthetics of it or the experience, the external experience that it has to come about. And the design artifact that comes about for this is treating AI art more so as a lensless camera. And so what this means is for this, I curated a data set of um, shadows. So I went on a walk and I took, and I took the liberty of going on a nature walk. 
and went around taking pictures of various shadows that were in the city to create a data set, which then would be translated towards the instantiation of experiences that you can draw with this. So the ones in Square are the ones that were generated via AI arts, um, which included aspects of a camera. So the aperture, the lens type, the angle, the time of day, these are the configurations of the camera. Then you have the actual descriptions of the image alongside the experience of what it meant to take that photograph in that moment in time. And this was seasoned from vocabulary from a experienced um, photographer. And so on the top left corner, I've brought the Canada Greece to their rightful home. Um, and so those are what we have there. And then on the bottom right, which is something I wanted to point out is the one in square, the AI art is almost very similar or feels as if it was there to take that photograph of the person that's walking through the park that for the image that entails a narrowed view. And so to bring it all together of the concept map that goes in full scheme is the sense of AI art aesthetics with the big picture being to draw it towards an aesthetic discipline that's not necessarily conjoined by the tools that are present to create the discipline, but rather have it stand on its own. So then the discipline arises in the same way that photographs say, for instance, were photograms, which were photography without a camera. Thank you. Thank you, Alight. Five minutes to the second. That was well-timed. Uh, we have a few minutes, exactly a few minutes for questions. One of the issues sometimes even with just like now phones is what they could be so many different things that it's actually the con lack of constraints that sometimes you're not really sure how to use it. S similarly, you're showing a really great progression, in, you know, within photography, but obviously you could use that exact same system. You would claim like a, a big terrible meme is, is its use in visual puns, you know, just the silliness. And then there are people doing it kind of deeper and moving through art spaces. So what is your thought about how to keep keep this parsing it, knowing that without these these typical constraints of, the, of in some ways, the hardware, what a photographer, what a camera can do versus what a paintbrush can do, and that you can move between them, kind of how do we parse that kind of reasonably? So parsing the constraints that could come about the, the medium being something you can learn. So learning how to use a paintbrush would be different from learning how to use a camera and the constraints that come about that. Um, one of which being is perhaps the more you interact. So there's an aspect in the paper as well where I mentioned. So a painter is tailored to paint to a certain scheme. Your, your eye tailors to the images that you see as you're walking, say, to see an image that you'd want to paint. In the same sense, a photographer's eye becomes tailored. The more for instance, on the here, when I was walking around taking the pictures, the more you take the pictures, the more you realize that your eye tailors to certain images that would be photographable per se. And in that sense, when you're playing out with the different mechanisms that are available on the camera, the configurations, that also allows you to navigate the aspects in which you'd want to capture the element. So you as a painter, knowing whether you want to use acrylic or watercolor or oil paint is in a similar sense, allows you to tailor as a photographer of the different configurations that you'd like to use. So perhaps it's acquired with each medium having its own affordance, but the, the that's sort of the differentiation that also exists within the mediums themselves about your choice to whether wanting, wanting to be a photographer or a painter. Time for another question. Okay, so uh, I have one of my own then. So one of the things that's really fascinating about these lensless camera photographs is that I find your photographs more interesting, mm -hmm. but from a sort of strict textbook compositional perspective, the lensless camera has sort of like followed all of the rules to a letter as regards, you know, uh, vanishing points and compositional perspectives and stuff like that. I'm thinking particularly of the park photo, right? Like that's, that's uh, uh, in a sense, um, it collapses when not given we're not given direct instructions. These algorithms collapse the kind of compositional space, the design space towards, uh, you know, we, we talk about mode collapse, but also this is kind of a stylistic mode collapse. Not only are all parks central park, but uh, all photos of a park are composed in exactly the same kind of way. Um, I wonder if 
that came up through your research through design, this, this idea uh, of stereotypical framings or, or uh, kind of high, highly typical framings at least. Mm -hmm. These are some of my thoughts. If it didn't come up in your chat, that's totally fine. No, that's totally doable. Um, so these are four of 64 shots that I took in totality. And these four I gr were grasped because of what it entailed in that moment of taking these photographs. So from a completely stylistic point of view, there were other images within the corpus that would visually look different as opposed to the actual experience that was exhibited within what we see here. So from the bottom left corner for the expression of intent, that was the shadow of a shrub that was on a random corner stone, but rather looking at it from an extensive point of view of just the image, it wasn't, it didn't necessarily have that element of this is an image that really looks interesting. It was more so, oh, when I took that picture, I didn't expect the photograph to look this way. So that was the element that came about it. But in terms of collapsing, the so the one on the bottom right corner of the person walking in the park, that could be any park. So that's there's a sense of collapse in that moment. But I think what's thrilling about that is the ability of the model to capture the photograph that was there in that moment. Perhaps I can play with the seeds a little more because what I have are the configuration of the camera, the experience of taking that photograph and the description. So ac accounting for a mode collapse or preserving the contextual element of that photograph within the prompt would be a way of preserving that and incorporating it. So definitely. All right, let's thank our speaker again. Eli, thank you. Thank you. So we now have, uh, Dan, I go straight into the community meeting. No, no, you're good. Don't worry. I, I... So we have a bit of an opportunity before we all jump on the bus and go look at the waterfall um, to have a uh, to have a brief community meeting um, to discuss uh, the way we want to conduct these uh, meetings in the future uh, and what the uh, substance. Uh, as well as the structure of these of these meetings should be, um, and I, I have some thoughts my myself that I want to throw some questions that I want to throw to the to the floor. Um, so I'm going to take chair's prerogative and kind of start with one of those. But I, I want to make sure that we we leave time in this discussion to hear from from you because that's kind of the point of a committee meeting. Um, 